Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be setting up a damage overlay as well as a health system for the player and some basic enemy AI to make them attack the player and a little bit of repositioning code to make them reposition. Now there was one thing I needed to fix with the cultist dissolve effect before we get started on that and then there's also a couple issues later on with making the material on the post processing effect actually reset after a scene reload due to death. The effect we're going to be going with is actually a post processing effect and it's going to be fading between just kind of a desaturation vignette so it'll be desaturating the edges of the camera to a red pulsing effect to a black pulsing effect to death so that, that way we've got a full range of transition at, based off of how damaged the player is and we're just going to be basing it off of the idea that the player can take three hits before they die and that's it so let's go ahead and dive in there we're going to be getting started right with the code and then we'll be doing a little bit of scene setup later all right, we're going to be diving right in with a couple fixes. First off, I needed to make an adjustment to the corpse dissolve effect. While I was despawning the body and moving the particles to the parent of the body, for some reason, seemingly random, the particles would reset to 000's position. So I went ahead and just reset the global position and rotation based off of whatever their global position and rotation were before I removed them from the ragdoll. And this kind of solves that problem. So we're going to save that and we can move on to the limb placement controller. There's a couple things we need to do here. First off, right up at the top, we need to change launch requested from a private Boolean to a public Boolean, but with the setter being private so that that way it can be changed, but it can be accessed from other things as there's some other scripts that we're going to be modifying that need to be able to read this information. Then in that same script down below the on launch requested, we're going to duplicate this on launch requested and we're going to use it to create a new function with on attack launch requested. And that's going to be passing in a parameter that is a node 3D. And instead of using the waypoint, we're going to be using that target. This is how we're going to make the AI actually jump at the player. The only real change we need to do is change up the requested velocity being equal to the waypoint waypoint position to the target dot global position. And this pretty much is all we need to do to make this script work. So we can go and save that and go over to the enemy AI controller. And this is where the bulk of our attacking and repositioning code is going to be handled. So if you need a new export category, and that's going to be for attack settings, we're going to be passing it in the limb controller. And then we also need a couple parameters for the various settings. So we have minimum and maximum attack delay. So that's the amount of time between each attack, as well as the attack initiate distance. So this is the distance from the player from which the AI can attack. I found setting this too high ended up with AI behind walls and stuff, just running into walls, trying to jump at the player. So I set it down to about six, and that just means the AI don't really attack the player unless they're pretty close to them. And then attack damage distance is the distance at which the AI is able to consider having gotten close enough to attack, at which point the AI will bounce off of the player and fly back. Now the attack force is going to be used to actually kick back the player. It's not going to be used for damage as right now we're kind of functioning on the same logic as the gun for the enemy health system where every attack does one damage. And then the attack force is just going to be propelling the rigid body of the player and the AI back away from each other with this force. And I found 30 was a pretty solid force, though it really does kick back the AI faster than it kicks back the player. So that may need to be adjusted later on. Now down here, just below everything else, we do need to go ahead and create a new Boolean for whether we're attacking or not, as well as a float for the attack cooldown, which we're going to be reusing for also the amount of time it waits before it considers an attack a failure, as neither one of those will be executed at the same time. Now we do do need a function down here for resetting the cooldown. So let's go ahead and create a new function called reset attack cooldown. We're going to create a new random number generator and we're just going to call it RNG. And then we're just going to randomize it and get a random float between the minimum and the maximum attack. And this will go ahead and give us our cooldown as well as a Boolean saying whether we're attacking or not. And that's pretty much all we need right there. But we do need to go ahead and create an attack function. And we're going to put this down below next to the set pathing target. Now the attack target's gonna take a parent node, which is whatever node it's trying to attack, and a Boolean returning whether it was successful. And the reason why it can technically be not successful is if the AI is currently aggroed towards an inanimate object or something without a damageable, it could not be able to find a damageable node. Now remember, in order to find damageable nodes, we're just using the get node function with the name damageable. So let's go ahead and get that and we'll just call it damageable. It'll be of type node and we'll be getting it off the parent node. Now, if the damageable does not equal null and the damageable is a damageable object, then we can go ahead and proceed. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and return false and we can return true inside of the damageable function. As we now know that there was a damageable and we can execute the code to damage it. So first off, we're going to use the hit object function in the damageable node. We'll be passing it in the navigation agent global position. Make sure you don't pass in the global position for this node as it doesn't really work that way for its positioning. 
And then we're going to also be passing in a vector because remember the hit object takes a force and a hit location. The force is going to be the parent node subtracted from the global position of this AI so that now we get a vector pointed towards the parent node. We're going to normalize that and multiply it by attack force. And remember, you also have to pass in an aggressor body node. So we're just going to pass in this node. Now, just below that, we're going to go ahead and create a bounce vector. Now, the bounce vector is going to kind of be the opposite of this force. It's going to be bouncing in the other direction. And before we actually apply the impulse, we're going to go ahead and set our pathing target to our global position plus that vector. And that's going to go ahead and make sure that even though it applies the impulse, it also goes ahead and paths in that direction. And we're going to make sure to apply the impulse after we set pathing target. Now, down here in the process function, we can go ahead and handle first off the attack cooldown. So we can say if attack cooldown is greater than zero, then go ahead and subtract delta from it, but make sure to clamp it between that and zero so it never goes below zero. So first off, we can say if we are attacking and our current target equals null, then attacking equals false and we just go ahead and return. This just makes sure that whatever we're doing, we don't attack nothing. Otherwise, there could be errors. Next up, we can get the distance from the current target's global position to the navigation agent's global position. And if it's less than equal to attack damage distance, then we need to go ahead and apply the damage. Now, mind you, you really should be doing this with a collider. I found that this is just a lot simpler to use, but it doesn't have quite as much satisfaction. So be aware in the future, I'm probably going to be doing some basic melee AI and I'm going to be doing it a little bit differently than this. But this kind of gets the point across for the time being. So for ourselves, we go ahead and reset the attack cooldown and we go ahead and run the attack target function with our current target. Now, if we haven't got that and our attack cooldown equals zero, then we need to go ahead and cancel our attacking because we've tried to attack for too long. This just makes sure that the AI doesn't jump against a wall trying to attack the player and then just sat there for like 30 seconds or something until it repaths. And otherwise we go ahead and return. So this just means that we, if we are attacking and all this is happening, we don't want to continue the process function because there's navigation AI down here. We just want to continue trying to attack. So that usually means that the AI is still in the air at which point we don't want to do anything else. However, that may also mean that the AI is just sitting against a wall somewhere, in which case the cooldown should handle that. Now, when we actually run the attack code, we're going to give it a cooldown. It'll be the amount of time it waits until it decides that it was a failed attack. Speaking of which, we can go ahead and go down here to where we're checking to see if the current target does not equal null. Then go ahead and set the pathing target on the navigation agent to the current target. We're going to create a new if statement that says if our current target does not equal null and our attack cooldown equals zero and our distance to the target position from the navigation agent's global position is less than the attack initiate distance and we're not launch request. This is important to make sure we don't fire it off multiple times when the AI is about to attack. Then we can go ahead and call that new function we created in the limb placement controller for the on attack launch requested and pass it our current target as well as a set new target function on the navigation agent with the current target's global position so that it is also pathing towards that location. We're going to set is attacking equal to true as well as the attack cooldown to a value which is going to be based off the distance. So we're going to take the current target's global position get its distance to the navigation agent global position and then we're going to divide it by the maximum velocity multiplied by the launch velocity multiplied. So that's the amount of time it's assuming the flight time should be. And then we're just going to multiply that by two to make sure we got plenty of time to get there. And if the attack cooldown zeroes out before then, then that definitely means we didn't make the attack successfully. I found that in an attack from about six meters away, this usually is around one to two seconds. And that gives it plenty of time to jump towards the player, miss, and then land, and then figure out that it didn't successfully attack. Now we do need to handle the damage on the player. So we have the damage ball object and that's going to handle the actual event, but we do need a player health controller. If we hop over to the Godot side of things, we can go ahead and create a new folder. We're just going to call this player. We may need to move the player body controller and the weapons effects controller in here later, but for the time being, this will just be this script. We're going to create a new script called player health controller. It's just going to inherit from node and go ahead and open it. Now, first off, we're going to need a reference to the player body controller, as well as a reference to the shader material. This I'm going to go over in just a second is the overlay that's going to be applying to the player whenever they're damaged. Now, the way we're going to be doing this health is we're going to be doing it almost kind of like Call of Duty or something like that, where you can take a couple hits. And then if you take too many hits, you just die. But if you wait about 10 seconds or so, it'll heal up. So first off, we're going to have the heal delay, which we're going to set to 10 seconds by default and the heal rate, which is going to be 0.5. You're going to need a health total. So we're going to set that to three as well as a flat 
flash fade rate. Now the flash fade rate, we're gonna make the overlay effect a little bit too powerful and then fade it back to the idle whenever you get hit. So that that way, if you're hit and it's just desaturating the edges of the camera, for example, it will flash red for a second, then go back to the desaturation, then wait about 10 seconds and then heat. Speaking of which, we need to go ahead and create a new public float for the current health. And that's gonna have a private sitter so that that way we don't set it anywhere else. And we're gonna need three private variables. The first one's gonna be a heal delay. Then we're also gonna have a current overlay weight, which is the weight between zero and three that the overlay is, as well as a current flash power. And the current flash power is that offset above the current overlay weight. And this will make sense once I go over to the shader. And this is actually probably a good time to go over to the shader and explain. I created a very simple post-processing effect and the shader, all it really does is overlay over the screen a desaturation effect at one. So you can't really see it here, but if I go ahead and add a color, you can kind of see how it desaturates the edges. It also has like a heart pulse here that I did via the shader as well as an overlay effect, which I just made some very garbage veins in Photoshop. And then it also has a tint gradient. Now the tint gradient, as you go up, actually tints it differently. So if I change the color rec to say like uh, green, and then set the damage overlay to two, we are now ha we're now two thirds of the way up the tent gradient. And this means that we have taken a second shot. If I set it up to three, we're now black. We're all the way at the end of the tent gradient. This is like the final stage before you actually die. So this is how I'm doing the effect. I'm doing it entirely as a post-processing effect because I found it just looks better. And you can see all of the code here. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but rest assured, I'm aware that post-processing is something that has been asked of me several times. So I'm gonna be going back over something like this whenever I do my post processing effects to explain everything. But for the time being, just know that this works. You can go ahead and pick this apart, use it in your own projects, to use it for whatever you like. All right, so all you need to know is if we set the effect strength between zero and three, zero being not damaged at all, one being desaturated, two being red, and three being black. So now we have our kind of gradient of our damage effect. And we can go ahead and bump that up or fade it down as necessary, and it just smoothly slides between all of the effects. So this will handle the damage overlay. So we need to drive it in here and that's gonna be the damage effect material right there. First off, let's go ahead and set our current health in the ready function. We're also gonna create a function that's just gonna return the target overlay weight. Hello, this is the editor speaking. I realized while editing this video that this entire clamp function really is just a remap function with like under a trench coat or something. So I ended up just replacing it with a remap function. All you do is pass in the current health divided by health total. So that'll be one when the current health equals the health total and zero when the current health equals zero. And then we pass that in with the in delta and two delta being zero and one. So one being max, zero being nothing to three to zero. So zero being max, three being. So that, that way when we output it, if we have no health, then we're outputting a three. And if we have t max health, then we're outputting a zero. And that does the exact same thing as all of this. There is no reason. All right, back to your regularly scheduled programming. And we do need to go ahead and create our on damage function. There's gonna be pulling from the signal from the damageable object. It's gonna have a hit location, a force and aggressor body node, just like we did on the AI. We're gonna be subtracting one from our health and then clamping it between zero and the health total. And we're gonna be handling a very simple death system here. If the current health equals zero, we're just gonna reload the current scene. This is not good. You should have a menu and probably next episode, I'm gonna be making a menu for this. But for now, we just need to know that we did in fact die. And now we can go ahead and handle our heal delay so we can reset our heal delay to whatever the max is and we can go ahead and set our current flash power equal to one and then we can go ahead and impulse the camera and apply our force based off the and apply our force to the velocity now this isn't perfect and in the future i would like to create an actual function in the player body controller that handles this force but for the time being this should work just fine and now we can go on down to the process function and get started on that. Now, the first thing we're going to do before we do anything else is handle healing. So we're going to check to see if the current health is less than the health total. And if so, if the current health delay is greater than zero, we're going to subtract from it delta. Otherwise, we're going to be adding to the current health heal rate multiplied by delta. And if the current health is greater than health total, we're just going to equal it to health total. So that this way it goes ahead and stops exactly at whatever the max health is. And that's going to be it for healing. That's going to be our regeneration. All right. So following the regeneration code, we're going to go ahead and set our current flash power equal to mathf.clamp current flash power minus delta multiplied by the flash fade rate. And then we're just going to clamp that between zero and one so it doesn't go below zero. And then we're also going to be getting our new target overlay weight. That'll be using this function right here, and it'll just be a float between zero and three. And if the new target overlay weight equals the current overlay weight and the current flash power equals zero, so that means that nothing has changed, then we just go ahead and return so we don't do anything unnecessarily. 
If that is not the case, then we're going to go ahead and add current flash power to the new target overlay weight. And we're going to check to see if the new target overlay weight is greater than the current overlay weight. Then we go ahead and immediately set it to it. However, if it's less than, then we go ahead and subtract flash fade rate from it multiplied by delta so that that way we're fading back down to zero. And if at that point it's less than the new target overlay weight, then we go ahead and equal it to the target overlay weight so that that way we don't overshoot when we're fading it back down to zero or whatever the new target overlay weight is. And whatever the result of that, we can go ahead and use the damage effect material dot set shader parameter function with the effect strength name, which is in the shader with the current overlay weight. So we can go ahead and set the overlay weight to whatever it currently is. And that should be pretty much it for the player health control. So we can go ahead and build and let's go ahead and implement this. So we need to create two new nodes. First one's going to be called damageable. And the second one's going to be called player health controller. On the player health controller, we're going to assign it the script of player health controller. We're going to be passing in the player body. We're going to be loading the damage effect. And it's called damage overlay material. It's saved in the material slash player folder. We can go ahead and select that and you can see it right here. And then all of these settings we can just leave alone. Now the damageable we do need to handle. So we can pass in a damageable object. We can leave impact effect alone. You may want to add your own, but be aware this is going to be right up next to the camera. So whatever you do add, make sure it's not too extreme. You'll now have that on damage function. We can go ahead and connect that to the player health controller. We can select the on damageable function and hit connect. And that should be pretty much it. We should be good to go. So let's go ahead and select our main scene. All right. So we're in game here. If we go ahead and let this thing attack us. You can test this out. All right, and you see it flashed red, and now we're desaturated at the edges. You can see down there on the bottom left-hand corner. We're flashed black whenever we get damaged. If we go ahead and wait for ourselves to heal, hey, hey, I ever comes down. Oh, oh, it got down. Okay. All right, and it attacked us again. Let's go ahead and let it kill us. All right, we flash black. Now we're red, and you can see the pulse effect. And if we die, we go ahead and restart. Now, that's the reason why I didn't want to actually use the restart of the level immediately so that that sort of lag didn't occur. And in the future, we will be doing a menu for this probably next week, but that'll be all for today. There was an issue with the overlay, and I'll go over that in just a moment. On the restarting of the game, it was kind of sticking around on reload, and I'll go over that real quick. All right, to fix the overlay, we're just going to go up here to where we are handling the death and go ahead and reset the damage effect material back to effect value of zero and this will go ahead and reset that before you die so that that way next time you come around you have a material that functions properly this is because we're actually editing the material in the resources folder as opposed to using an instance shader variable which i would have liked to use but the canvas items themselves don't have access to instance shader variables and we're using a shader type of canvas item for this post-processing effect now there is also another way to do post-processing effects and that involves creating a mesh that's in front of the camera at all times and I'll be going over that in the post-processing video at a later date, and that one actually has access to things like the depth texture and things like that. But for the time being, this will work just fine for this effect. All we're doing is just a pretty simple overlay with a little bit of desaturation effect. But that'll be it. I hope you all learned something, and I hope you all have a wonderful week. We'll see you all back here next week for the next tutorial.